Thanks for having me back. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I give one talk and they go, well, that's plenty. That was plenty. Um, I, I moved back to Arkansas in 2009 uh, for the purposes of helping start the state trauma system. I served as the medical director of the system for uh, about six years. And we had a very, we had a fascinating experience. And I think as I hear about what's going on in Arizona right now, as you're opening rules and you're looking at funding sources, I hope this uh, this talk is germane to what you're what you're trying to do. Just like everywhere else in the world, this was a typical Friday night in Little Rock, Arkansas, um, and it remains uh, injury related death remains the, the a public health crisis that we really have not cured. And so I'm grateful to you and uh, for everything that you're doing and your both your care and your injury and violence prevention efforts. Our problem was is that it was the number one cause, it is the number one cause of death, and we were fairly complacent about it. You drive down the road, you drive through beautiful parts of the Ozarks, and you see the big H on the side of the road, and you assume that if the car rolls off there, you're going to go and you're going to get standard care, care commensurate with any place else in the country. And that simply was not the case. Simply wasn't the case. We had sort of three hits in fairly rapid succession from about 2006 to 2009 where the AMA, the College of Emergency Physicians, the CDC, the College of Surgeons all came in and said that far and away we were, we were the worst in the country. We had the highest mortality, highest morbidity in the country and it was because we had no organized system. We had a designation process that was antiquated. Uh, we couldn't move a time-sensitive patient from place of injury or place of stroke or place of heart attack to a definitive care area in a timely way. We just had no organi organization. And this hurt us because being, being last, being told we were last really, really hurt because typically we rely on Mississippi to sort of keep us off the very <laughs> bottom, Tina. But, um, but I mean, we were, we, were, we were absolutely the worst. And so for those of us who are public health people, um, this was a huge wake up call for us. We really had to sort of say, um, I, love, I love the people of Arkansas because they're, they're kind and they're, they're accepting and uh, we were somewhat complacent about this, however. And if you weren't a public health person uh, and you really thought, well, that's a problem of Little Rock, that's a problem of the big city, is that high mortality rate. That's not a problem for us in the rural part of the state. Then this happened. The eastern part of our state is covered very, very well from an outstanding, two outstanding hospitals in Memphis, just over the Arkansas, just over the Mississippi River. The Med, which is a, a fantastic uh, adult trauma center, and Le Bonner, which is a fantastic pediatric trauma center. And so the eastern part of our state was protected, really, if you will, f f uh, by those two institutions. Well, they had some financial crisis, and as city county hospitals sometimes do, they forgot to turn in bills, and their response to that was, well, we just won't take care of anybody outside of our state borders. So all of a sudden, the people that thought, well, I guess it could happen to us and our safety net is about to go away became sort of disturbed and that included a few key legislators in the state at the time. And then again, if those two things didn't move you, the public health issues and the safety net, the loss of the safety net hospitals didn't move you, this moved the remainder of the decision makers. If you took in 2007, if you took motor vehicle crashes in the state of Arkansas, one disease, one year, direct medical care, just direct medical care for that was $254 million. So we're a very poor state that we can ill afford to spend $254 million in direct medical care, and that's just one disease. That, that, didn't, that didn't take into account any of our falls, any of our ATVs, any of those things. It was just motor vehicle crashes. Direct medical care was felt to be somewhere in the magnitude of a billion dollars for one year there. So no matter what motivated you, uh, whether it was the public health, whether it was the perception of loss of your, of your safety net, or whether it was the financial impact, uh, there was a crisis in the state. So it brought together a, a fairly disparate group of, of stakeholders 
to try to answer this problem. And I think this really leads to my first set of lessons learned in development of this system. You have to first acknowledge that you have a problem. And I think you, and I think you have to have somebody else come in and do a critical uh, independent analysis of where you sit and let you know whether you do or don't have a problem in a region. And then I think you have to find ways to make it personal to whomever you're trying to influence. And that's going to be uh, people like us. It's easy to influence us. We have to sit in a small room with the families and hold their hand and tell them that a loved one just passed. And we do that so often that it's the public health issue that, that moves us. But there are those who are charged with looking after the fiscal responsibility of a state or a region. And uh, you have to find ways in which to speak to them. Uh, and then there's a group who's somewhat complacent. So you have to talk to them about potential loss of their safety net or, or a sense that, that, that this really could happen to them, their children, their grandchildren, their loved ones. This is not just a problem of the urban center. It's a very interesting balancing act, however, in getting everybody on the same page to move toward a solution uh, for this. And sometimes you, you go about it and you, you can go about it in different ways, but you have to figure out politically how you can do it in your area. In our area, in 2009, the legislature did, was moved. They did uh, find funding for the system and they passed statute, updated, st updated existing statute actually. And they tasked the Department of Health with these very specific things uh, within the state. And I'll try to go through those for you. The first was the creation of a statewide registry. And I think if I could say one mistake we made was we probably started this too late. Because what you really ultimately want to do is demonstrate an outcome. And to do that, you need pre-data. You need, you need reliable, consistent pre-data. So the establishment of a registry first was, a, was a, the right move. I wish we'd have had it up front. We used one vendor. It was managed by the state. The, the data dictionaries were common for everybody in the state. The registry was given to every hospital in the state. Large hospitals were able to maintain their own registry and their own outcomes module so that they could do, drill down and, and use their own registry. Small hospitals that didn't have staff and didn't have support uh, it, was web, it is web-based, and so it's managed centrally at the Department of Health. Very nominal cost, uh, very nominal cost to this. I guarantee you that if you add up your individual registries, the cost is much, much more than if you, if you do it centralized and have it managed uh, with a minimal effort at the Department of Health. The next thing was is, uh, establish criteria for designation. And I, there's a lot of debate in here, and I, I have, I, I'm not sure the way we did it was, was best, but again, it's that balancing act. This is what we could do. We essentially took the College of Surgeons, um, we had on the books actually already, the College of Surgeons statute, or the College of Surgeons criteria from about three books back. And that was what was adopted. It did not meet modern standards but it was at least something that everybody could get behind. It was something that the Department of Health could get behind. It was something that the hospital associations could get behind at the time, and it got us into the game. It got us thinking about trauma and got everybody singing off the same sheet of music. We got people giving data to the registry. We got in to do education. Uh, we got to do injury and violence prevention. Uh, and it, so it, it brought us together, and that's what we could get at the time. There were only 70 hospitals. There are only 70 hospitals in the state that were eligible, and 68 of them participated initially. It was voluntary, and it was it was funded. And I'll come back to that in a moment. We created a statewide communication center. One of our challenges was is that we could not get a patient from site of injury to first hospital to tertiary hospital in under six and a half hours. That was our median. That was our median from time of injury to definitive care was about six and a half hours. And a lot of that had to do with EMS picking a patient up and going blindly to the nearest hospital, not understanding what their real-time capability and capacity were. So you show up at a level four hospital that has no general surgical capability with a patient with non-compressible thoracic or abdominal bleeding, there, you have provided them no benefit, no benefit. And this was a very tough, this sounds simple to us, but it was a very tough political thing because the ambulance 
people, that's their hospital, that's where they're going. They don't want to leave their county, they don't want to leave their catchment area. They sometimes didn't have resources to be able to do that. So this was very, very, a, a big change uh, for us. So the communication center at least advised them what the real-time capability and capacity. This is our then Governor Beebe, who was instrumental in setting up the system in front of the comm station that has every hospital in its real-time capability and capacity. And then if you want to move a patient in the state, so what's required by statute now is that if you meet CDC triage criteria for major or moderate trauma, you have to call the call center, and the call center will direct you to the appropriate nearest hospital. Obviously, you can go to the, near, the, the closest hospital if you have uncontrolled external hemorrhage or you have an airway problem, but it would move you to the right hospital. And then if you want to transfer within our system, you have to call the call center to understand that for sure you're, getting, you're going to a place that has the capability and capacity at that moment uh, for that patient and to know where all the traffic is moving. And this has absolutely eliminated uh, double transfers uh, for us in the state. So our average time now, our average time now from the time that a primary hospital uh, picks up the phone and starts looking for an accepting hospital was about two hours before and it's about six and a half minutes now uh, by the time all of this is recorded, all of this goes through a PI process and the, the, the level three and level four hospitals will tell you this has been the absolute best thing for time sensitive diseases uh, that's happened in our system. And we've sent, we subsequently rolled it out for stroke and STEMI. So this has been a huge thing. We clearly needed to raise all ships in our, in our Navy at one time. EMS, nurses, physicians needed to, be, needed to have modern education. And the way to do this really was through a third party uh, educational foundation that blanketed the state very quickly with trauma specific uh, education. This was funded, the funding source, uh, it, it varied year to year and sometimes it would be as low as about six, 700,000 and sometimes as high as about 1.1 million. But for 1.1 million, we educated an entire state. Every, every surgeon in the state became current in ATLS. Every, uh, two thirds of the surgeons in the state took the asset course. Every nurse in the state had adequate, ample opportunity to get into a TNCC course. And because it was subsidized by the state, the cost for these were every course was $100 for a physician, $50 for a nurse, and $25 for a medic. And we were able to blanket the state almost uniformly with trauma-specific education all at one time. So the lessons that we really learned from that were to be very purposeful in your objectives of the system to say we expect a designation process, we expect a communication process, we're going to eliminate uh, time delay in moving people, and these are going to be our outcome measures and we're going to be purposeful in moving uh, toward those. Uh, and, then the, and then the education and the, and the uh, call center were paramount in that. We kept coming back, once we trained people how to think about trauma and how to think about being in a trauma system, now it was time to come back and try to raise the standards and be, be modern. I, I, I defend, I defend in, in, with my people and I'll defend in front of anybody, there's nothing about the state of Arkansas that doesn't mean that we ought not be able to meet at least the minimal national standards of the American College of Surgeons. And I'll tell you why I think it's better to seed that those standards to a centralized body because then you're not arguing about it on a regional local level. You're not, because if, if you do that, there's going to be somebody that's going to argue that they know what's going on at their hospital and they're going to argue for a lower standard at their hospital based on what they think, you know, politically they can get away with. If you just say best knowledge available today and not that the college process doesn't have any politics to it. But at least, I, I defend the process, at least it is the best data we've got today and it's an iterative, continuously improving process. And if you just put that, those standards on the table and say that's what we're going to meet, I think, you'll end up, I think you'll end up doing better. So I, I, I think we have not done this perfectly and I would encourage any system that's thinking about what to do with their, with their rules uh, to consider uh, simply adopting the college standards. 
So the lessons I think are learned is you've got to have some money to do these things. Interestingly, it's not as much money as you think. Uh, our budget is $19 million a year, and that's, that's very good. And a lot of that money, quite frankly, goes to the hospitals and to the EMS agencies as a block grant. It was just given out. And there are states, obviously, that fund uh, uncompensated care. I personally think both those methods are wrong because they, they set the incentives differently. What we did in Arkansas was we bought participation. And once we gave it out and we had standards at this level, if you wanted to raise those standards and you wanted different participation, everybody needed more money to do that. And there was no more money within the system. To me, it makes sense to incentivize the behavior that you want to see. If you want to see hospitals move that, that are really op able to operate as a level two, if you want to see them move from a three to two, incentivize that behavior. If you want to see them move from a state designation to a national ACS designation, incentivize that behavior. If you want to encourage specific uh, compliance with clinical practice management guidelines that you find are important in your state incentivize that behavior. So my suggestion after our experience is reserve funds to be able to incentivize the behavior that you're trying to encourage within the system. How you end up funding it is always sausage making. Uh, we, we tax, we have a cigarette tax and it's essentially a sin tax because there really was no lobby for the smokers. That was, that's the truth of it. And so uh, to me, that, that, that's how we got it. It was, we could get it that way. It doesn't completely make sense. It sort of offends my sensibility when it's the super speeders and the drinkers and the ATVs that are end up causing the injuries or the lack of smoke detectors or the falls. That's what ends up causing the injury and incurring the cost. And yet we place the burden, the financial burden in a little bit different place. So. Again, that's the balancing act that you'll have to face. You get what you can get where you can get it. And that's a, that's a local political thing uh, that you'll have to work out on your own. The trauma image repository was one of these novel, unique things that we didn't plan for at the beginning, but that, uh, that uh, became apparent that we needed. We were moving uh, some 80% of our patients do not start at a tertiary care center. They start in a, in a local rural area. They're often imaged. And then they come to the tertiary care center and they're re-imaged. And we delay, we incur cost, and we increase radiation exposure. And so uh, there are proprietary uh, companies that do this. We simply did it internally, run through the call center. This system costs just about a million dollars a year. And what it does is every hospital in the state can push their images into the center, and then it's picked up by the referring hospital. They go into a, a, a portal, uh, type in the patient's trauma band number, and then bring the images out. And in many places, they go directly into our packs. And we have many children alive in our hospital that we were able to take straight from a helicopter into an operating room because we'd already seen the images. We'd already pushed them to our neurosurgeon. We already had a team and an operating theater set up, and we were ready to go. It's decreased time to definitive care, and it's absolutely saved lives, and it's not, it's not that much money, uh, really. The other thing that we've been working with that we thought was you know, not novel, but that we've used maybe in a novel way is telemedicine capability. Because of some disaster funds, the state had been set up with telemedicine equipment all throughout the state that was interconnected and it really wasn't being used. So we asked if we could borrow bandwidth on the T1 lines and we use it uh, for time sensitive uh, diseases. We were, we were flying people out of the state every single night to go get potential reimplantations for hand and extremity injuries only for them to get to Louisville or to get to Dallas or get somewhere have the, have the surgeons look at them and say, that's not a re-implantable uh, problem, put them back in an ambulance and send them back home at a cost of about $23,000 each for that transport. So what we do today is we don't have enough hand surgeons to cover the whole state on call, but we, ha I mean, every hospital does, obviously doesn't have hand surgeons, but we have about enough that can cover this telemedicine call. So if you want to move a patient with a hand injury in our state today, 
or a burn injury or some pediatric injuries, you have to call the call center. The call center hooks you up through telemedicine. The specialists look at it. I have an iPad at my home. I get a phone call on my pager. It says go to room four and I open it up and I see the burn patient. The hand surgeons see the hand patient and we help with triage decision makings. We virtually eliminated unnecessary transfers out of our system and costly transfers for unnecessary hand injuries. We've improved the accuracy of resuscitation for burn. We've improved the triage of burn patients uh, with this system and it's incredibly low tech. The budget for this is about $600,000 if I remember it uh, correctly. But we've paid for that in, in spades. We've paid for that in multiples in the savings of, mo of unnecessary movement of patients. So one of my lessons learned is retain some funds. Don't give out all the funds, and I, I, make, I make the hospital associations mad. Don't give out all the funds to the hospitals. Don't give them all out to the, keep, retain some money for innovation. There are going to be some things that are particular to Arizona as they were to Arkansas that are needs and if you have given out, if you've obligated all your money uh, in those things, you don't have the ability to spend $600,000. That, that is not a lot of money in a state system for an image repository or a million dollars for a statewide education foundation or the telemedicine program, something like that. That's just not a lot of money to make those things happen. And then I really would encourage you to get outside eyes. Again, sometimes the politics internally prevent you from either seeing the opportunities or getting to resolution on some of those opportunities. And so the American College of Surgeons does have a systems evaluation committee that can be very, very helpful. And there are people that have, have sort of helped with system evaluation and setting up in many places in the country. And I would encourage you as you, as you think through your new process to get some outside evaluation and help. We're able to do quality assurance, and many states are not able to do this. We're actually able to bring cases to a centralized area, put them on the table, bring the parties together, and discuss them. And at first, everybody was sure that uh, this was going to be the big hospitals picking on the small hospitals. This was going to get out. We were going to incur liability uh, from this, and it's absolutely done perfectly the opposite. What it's done is it, it's built tremendous collaboration among our hospitals in a joint performance improvement as we look for opportunities within our system to improve. Uh, we've had no legal issues uh, with this and we've seen a tremendous benefit from being able to, from being able to do statewide quality assurance. I think you have to have this in a system and I know these are tough political battles uh, at, at the legislative level, usually with the trial lawyers to indemnify this data from discoverability. But if there's any way for you to do that as you think about your new rules, uh, I would encourage you to do so. You've got to demonstrate the, uh, the efficacy of the, of the money that's been spent. So this is just the educational dollars. I think very rarely does state government do anything that you can point to cause and effect this was money given for the Educational Foundation to teach the Rural Trauma Team Development Course. In the Rural Trauma Team Development Course, one of its premises is that you make a decision about transfer within 15 minutes. Our average time before, before teaching this class was about three hours until the first call came for transfer from level four hospitals for major trauma patients. No surgical capability, major trauma patients, three hours until we got the first call. We taught the Rural Trauma Team Development class, and you see on the uh, right side of your screen what the results uh, were. It decreased that by, by about a half an hour to begin with, and that number continues to decline uh, over time as the penetrance of the course goes up. Now, that's still way too long, but that's a cause and effect. That's a direct cause of going out and teaching this class uh, throughout the state. We then performed a preventable mortality study. There had only been three or four places in this country that had done region-wide preventable mortalities where you truly do a Delphi process and you bring stakeholders together, you take the death charts and you put them on the table and you go through them and you say this was preventable, not preventable, or, or acceptable care and you identify opportunities uh, for improvement. We were able to do that uh, with pre-system charts in 2009 and then we chose a, a very aggressive timeline in 2013-14 uh, 
uh, to do this and uh, put the group together to look for opportunities. Here's what we found before the system development. We affirmed what the other agencies had told us. Preventable mortality rate was 30 percent. One in three patients, three out of ten patients who died of injury in the state of Arkansas, their death could have probably been avoided had they received optimal care. It's abysmal. It was, ab it was abysmal. Uh, states that have started this in the past have been at about 20 percent and well-functioning uh, systems are down to three, four, five percent. So we really affirmed again that we had a problem. Uh, about 50 percent of those hospitals had additional opportunities for improvement and only very little of the care was deemed to be appropriate for those that died of injury. The beauty of this is we were able to dive down and figure out where the problems were. So the deaths early were from hemorrhage. And so good. Now we've got an educational arm that's out there blanketing the state. What we can do with that is really work on early hemorrhage control. We can teach surgeons the asset course. We can teach medics about tourniquets. We can talk about uh, hemostatic dressings. We can talk about getting people moved faster. So it really focused our educational efforts and some of our policy efforts to know what it was we were trying to accomplish there. We were able to look at different carriers. We were able to look at pre-hospital, ED, OR, and figure out where the opportunities were. So in the pre-hospital arena, it was about airway management. And so we have courses specifically for pre-hospital providers in airway management, chest, chest injury management, chest tube placement, and we've blanketed the state with that because of the data uh, that came out of the preventable mortality study. So here's the before and after. We were at 30%. It, near, it was cut nearly in half in a four-year period, which is pretty unprecedented. All the other studies had been over about a 10-year period, had shown a similar 50% reduction. We were able to show it in about a four-and-a-half-year four period. Care appropriate nearly doubled. And the biggest change that we saw is we were organized and getting a trauma team to the patient's bedside if they had a, a significant injury. And we felt like that was probably the biggest cause of the increase in our, in our, in our savings there. The overall mortality, because of the preventable mortality decrease, the overall mortality decreased by 4%. You say, well, that, that doesn't sound a lot. But at 2,500 deaths a year, a 4% change, and when you give that number and the average age uh, to the health economist at our School of Public Health, that translates into $177 million in tax dollars saved by our Kansans who didn't die. That's about a nine-fold return on investment. So no matter which side of the, you know, in, in our state, taxation is a bad word and this was a tax given to the Department of Health to organize the, the system, but it, returned, it had a ninefold return on investment. And I, I, would, I would guarantee you that any place in the country that gets this organized and implements this is going to return, have a return on investment of money given uh, to improve trauma care. Our preventable mortality decrease and our, our trauma team was felt to be the biggest part. What we're doing now is we're drilling down deeper into uh, hospitals, and we're trying to look now at hospitals longitudinally over time and hospitals with hospitals. We are level one and level two hospitals participate in TQIP. All of our state is participating with the Michigan TQIP or the Arbor Metrics uh, group in a risk adjusted benchmarking to, to look at our performance uh, over time and to see where other opportunities exist for us. One of the other things that I think we did not do very well is we made, we, we did not keep our constituency informed well enough. I think, for, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a naive public health servant, trauma surgeon. If I get a, you know, it's a good day. I, I get to walk out and patients are doing better. I feel good. What I failed to realize really was that the public needed to know about it. The elected officials needed to know about what good work, and that's a little counterintuitive. The self-aggrandizement is not really part of who I am, and, but, but somebody within the system needs to do it. You have to let your legislature and the public know what you're doing. They need to be the drivers of your continued uh, success. So be very clear on your evaluation plan. If you get new rules, 
say here's why we're getting new rules, what we expect to achieve with those new rules, and be sure you have an evaluation plan that's set up correctly to demonstrate that you either did or didn't get there, and be brave enough to put the data on the table. If you're not right in some places and we were not always moving in the right direction, course correct and be brave enough to do that. Measure the before and after. The preventable mortality study is a terribly powerful tool uh, for us and I would really encourage you to think about setting aside some funds to do something like that as you write your new rules. And then do a better job than I did certainly uh, about keeping the public and the elected officials informed and make them your champions for continued success of your program. Again, I realize we didn't always do it well. We balanced it. We got what we could get in certain areas. You'll do the same. You'll get what you can get in certain areas, but keep moving forward and let, let, the, let the legislators and the public help you with that. Don't forget how powerful you are as a lobby you are respected, you are the authority, you do need to lock arms and you do need to be at the legislature and you do need to be at these meetings advocating for this funding, advocating for changes that really do make sense, not what's just politically expedient or good for one health care system or another health care system. You need to be arguing for the highest standard that you can achieve. Uh, and you're, you're, you're more powerful in that effort than you know. My last few lessons learned from our system were that you do need funding. Uh, you'll get a long way doing what you're doing. Volunteerism is good, but it only gets you so far. There's going to be some things that must be funded and must be paid for. Some of the advocacy efforts, some of the novelty uh, things that will really improve the, the performance within your system need some funding and you need to go find those things. And then get external validation. There's nothing more powerful to either a legislature, to a body, than to have an outside group come in and affirm uh, the good work that you're doing. There's a very predictable lifespan of this. It's all, it, it, everybody's enthused at first, and then there's some hard work to do, and there's some naysayers, and you feel a little bit lonely as you do this work right at the beginning, but then you come out on the other side and things work, and the phone calls I get today are not, I can't, you know, I can't believe we're going to make changes and do these things. They are, we made those changes and it was working and last night it didn't work. And those are the calls. And when I start getting those phone calls, I know we've succeeded. So I, I'm happy about that. And that's the, that's the natural life expectancy of this program. So my final thought is, is that trauma is a good example. And our experience with trauma in Arkansas was a good example of how you set up a system for time sensitive uh, disease. It was, it, it worked for us. It didn't work, uh, everything didn't work, but I think we learned a lot of lessons from it. There's a lot of synergy in managing those time sensitive diseases together, like stroke, STEMI, and trauma. Uh, I, I think there is some synergy to that, and ultimately you'll end up uh, saving a lot of lives in Arizona as we've done in Arkansas. So thank you very much again for listening. I appreciate it.